Welcome back to another episode of Unscripted, the go-to podcast for those flipping the script and taking the unexpected path. I'm your host, Jessica Burgio, holistic life and business coach, author, speaker, and self-proclaimed high-energy hype girl. Each week, I'm bringing you inside. No gatekeeping here. I'll touch on proven holistic business strategies, powerful mindset shifts that have led my clients through massive transformations, and no BS conversation with industry leaders designed to help you get out of your own way to actively pursue a life of purpose. If you're ready to ditch the limitations at the door, hit follow and get ready to be activated to step boldly towards your big goals. Now let's dive in. Guys, I just wanted to pop in real quick before we jump into today's episode and share with you why I'm obsessed with Glossy, the brand new skincare routine that you can drink from my good friend, Lori Harder. She has honestly created a product I can't live without. Let's be honest, our time is too precious for a 10 step skincare routine, let alone knowing what different vitamins you should be taking every morning. Well, the good news is Glossy can be your go-to wellness solution. This is not your average beauty product. It's a skin and gut superfood designed to work its magic from the inside out. The result? A lighter, more glowing you, ready to conquer each day with newfound energy and confidence. I've really noticed my skin is glowing and my gut feels better than ever. The probiotic that was created for this product has been run through over 30 clinical studies. The hyaluronic acid increases hydration, making your skin look and feel smoother and plumper. And we all know zinc supports our healthy immune system. Vitamin C helps to boost your body's production of collagen, while prickly pear and coconut water powder help support your hydration levels. And then my favorite, which is magnesium, helps support our metabolism, bone health, and keeps us regular, while helping to maintain reduced levels of stress. Pretty much a perfect product, in my opinion. I have a big discount for any new subscribers. Just click the link in the show notes below and grab your first order of Glossy today. And for a limited time, screenshot your receipt and send it to me in a DM on Instagram, and I will enter you into my Glossy giveaway. Now let's jump back into the episode. This Tuesday, we have another amazing guest for you, and she is somebody that I've admired for many years. She's been a mentor from afar and near. I've heard her speak on stages. I've watched her grow her business, and I just really wanted to bring this story to light with you guys here on the show because I think it's really important, as I know a lot of you are pivoting from maybe one thing to another or thinking about moving into a new space and you're not quite sure where to start. Jess is someone who can take all of those ideas, all of that confusion, all of that, I don't know where I should begin, how to do it, and help you take action to getting you to the place that you want to be with your business, and then even more so in an aligned way that it's working for you. You're not the only thing in the business that's working the business. So Jess, welcome to the show. How are you? Good, Jess. Thanks for having me. This is so fun. I know. I love podcasting. We just got a podcast together on hers a few weeks ago. I just want to kick off with your story because it's so powerful and it is, I think, such an important part of how you were able to take something that maybe felt like it wasn't going to be a skill set you could use somewhere else And in fact, it actually was. I think a lot of people don't realize the things they already know and the experiences they have that could actually help them create a new business or a different leg of their business or make a complete pivot like you did. So will you share with the listeners just a little bit of your backstory? Yeah, it's always interesting. I'm like, how far back do we go? I've had so many, I call them pirouettes instead of pivots, but I've had so many pirouettes over the years. I'll take you back to the beginning of the online business for me. So the online business started in 2012, which makes me a grandma in this industry. In 2012, I was working full-time as an elementary school teacher. And then I was working part-time as a personal trainer. At the time, I was already 10 years in as a personal trainer and I was a school teacher. I would get home at 325. My husband would get home at nine o'clock at night. We were living the American dream, New Jersey. He would commute into New York City. The whole thing, white picket fence, paycheck to paycheck. And in the time between 325 and 9 p.m. when he would get home, I needed to fill the gap. And so I just started dabbling in this idea that maybe I could do something else. And it really stemmed from bodybuilding competitions. So I had signed up for my first bodybuilding competition back in 2012. I hired a coach. She was in Massachusetts. I lived in New Jersey. And she was sending me weekly workout plans and like macro guides. And I was paying her. And I had this light bulb moment of, wait a minute, I've been a trainer for a decade. All of my friends from high school and college want me to train them, but I don't live in the same state as them. What if I email them and I'm like, hey, you can pay me virtually and we can do this. That's how it started. Honestly, I sent out an email to a bunch of friends from high school and college, said, do you want me to train you? If you do, let me know. And they started snail mailing me $79 checks, like actual checks in the mail. $79 a month is what I charged. And I would write everybody's workout plans and I would email them back to them. And for five years, that worked. And I started writing blogs and I was just following the trends of what I saw in the fitness online industry. And so I was writing blogs and I was selling $79 ebooks and 12 week programs. And then I started doing pop up Facebook groups and free challenges. And I was on Periscope. I was doing all these things just in the pockets of my day. Honestly, it was, I was bored. 
I had time. I wanted to help people. And my $50,000 salary wasn't cutting it. I just started dabbling. And I dabbled for five years, never thinking that it was going to turn into anything. And then it was actually 2017. I'm a school teacher driving to work, listening to a podcast. And this man was interviewing this woman, and she was a school teacher. And she sold jewelry on Etsy. Now, the part of the story I didn't tell you was I also went to fashion school, so I was also selling jewelry on Etsy. So I'm like listening to this podcast. I'm in the dashboard. Is he talking to me? This is crazy. So she wanted to go all in on her jewelry business, but that's crazy. You're going to leave your teaching job with like summers off and benefits and salary. So she was nervous. And he said, if you give yourself a year to try to do the Etsy thing full time and it didn't work out, what would be your worst case scenario? So she said, I'd go back to teaching. I've been a teacher for a decade, but I might have to go to a different district. I know I can get a job. And his answer changed our entire life because he said to her, oh, how does it feel to wake up every day and live in your worst case scenario? It was like a dagger through my heart. I pulled the car over on the highway. I texted my husband, Mike, and I said, I can't do this anymore. That was October of 2017. About two weeks later, I walked into my principal's office and resigned. And I had no plan other than I will do whatever I need to do to make ends meet. And let me just rewind a little bit too. My little cute side hustle that I was doing was making like $300 a month. I had not replaced my full-time income at all. On a good month, I was doing about $1,000 a month. So I wasn't even close to my income. And for me, I'm like a burn the bridges girl. So I just had to leap and figure it out on the way down so long as I could remove my ego and maybe take a job that I thought I was above or higher than. At this point, I had three college degrees. I'm 31 years old. I have a house with a mortgage. So there was a lot of stories that I had to work through of where I should be or what it should look like. And so as long as I could remove that and maybe get a part-time gig or ask for help or buy the course, it was like, okay, I'm going to make this happen. And just a couple of months later, that was the end of my teaching journey in that capacity. I left the school district. I left teaching. We moved to New York City. And then I exploded my online fitness business to a million dollars a year within the first 18 months. And so that's where the story kind of began. That's incredible. And I love that you could have heard something similar to what that man said on that podcast from somebody else at the wrong time that wasn't going to land the same. And I love when moments like that happen. They're just like, I think, downloads from God. Like, you need to hear this right now in this moment while you're driving literally in the real time, because it's hard for a lot of people to make shifts and changes when things are semi-comfortable, even if they're not ideal, even if you wish every single day for something different. It's such a scary thing to bet on yourself. People will bet on other people all day long. They'll work their ass off for somebody else, check the boxes because there's a quote unquote guaranteed salary. But we know now more than ever, a lot of people feel like that's not safe anymore either to be able to make those shifts and to go all in. I know probably a lot of people listen to this podcast with my personality, I feel would really resonate with the fact that you're like, I'm a burn the bridges kind of person. I need to just go all in. And I find maybe you do too with clients, the ones that have the biggest levels of success are the ones that actually go all in versus the ones that are just toe dipping and putting something out there and, oh, I tried that, but it didn't work for me. Or I tried that once. And we see that in so many arenas of the things that you teach, whether it's social media or creating email lists or having to know that something's going to have a direct ROI in a concise amount of time. Can we talk about expectations? Because it feels like you didn't even allow that to be a thing for you because you didn't have anything you were quote unquote comparing it to. I think you almost missed the window of real comparison because of social media and what everybody else was doing. It's so saturated now. We can't help but look right or left and see someone doing maybe what we want to be doing and get a little overwhelmed that A, we'll maybe never catch up. We don't want to copy somebody. That's already being done. When I went to beauty school, nobody said, oh, you shouldn't be a hairdresser. There's already so many of them. Yet there are so many of them, but there are so many clients too. So walk us through like when you get clients now, what are some of the things that you have to work through. You spoke about ego and what about expectation? How do we combat some of that? Because I know people are probably listening thinking, I want to learn what she has to teach now, but what about X, Y, and Z? Yeah. The landscape has changed. I started 12 years ago in this industry. And at the time, it was actually competitive and saturated. Nothing like today, but it already was. There were people that I was looking up to and learning from and mentors and programs that I was buying who were light years ahead of where I was when I was starting. So It's always been that way. And I think that's in any industry because there's always going to be the early adopters. But for me, expectations equal experience. So the expectation that you set, whether it's for yourself or for your clients, it's going to be the experience that the person then has. There's a fabulous book written by Christine Hassler. It's called Expectation Hangover. I'm not like affiliated with it, but I love this book because 
she really talks about how an expectation is essentially a promise that you've made, usually to somebody else, but you didn't actually sign off on it. Like, I didn't actually make the promise with you. It just happened in my head. And then you broke said promise. So then I'm upset. I'm resentful. I'm frustrated. I'm mad. I'm fill in the blank. And so it's really interesting when we do layer these expectations on self or other people because there's the, like this unwritten promise that's not actually there. It's like a little contract you didn't write. That's the experience that you're going to have. I think, again, I was an adult. This was years ago. And the ego for me was a big thing. And one of our mutual friends and mentors, dear friend of mine, Chris, he always used to say, ego is your biggest overhead and it's costing you. And so if you could remove the ego of, I know this, yeah, but I've already tried this, or I feel stupid, I should know this, I don't want to ask for help. Once I removed that and I started to take really fast, messy action, not tied to the outcome with a little pinch of ignorance is bliss. If I'm being honest, I think at the beginning of my journey, whether it was 12 years ago or seven years ago, whichever timeline we're looking at, I had nothing to compare it to for myself. There was no data or metric where it was like, my launches usually do X, Y, and Z, and I normally bring in X amount of people. It was just, I'm throwing spaghetti at a wall, and if it's sticking, I'm going to keep doing it. And every decision that I made, especially when I left my job in 2017, was, is this fun? And Mike would say it to me all the time. He's like, babe, you didn't leave your job to go do something that you hate. Is this fun? Is this exciting? Now, that does not mean that I did not spend hours on the couch crying, learning how to build my own website. Not everything is rainbows and unicorns, but it was like the decisions I was making moving forward were coming from a place of, does this light me up? Is this fun? Does this feel in alignment? Is this something that is exciting for me right now, even if it's not working? And I think this is where we have to be really mindful, especially when it comes to expectations and comparison. We cannot allow our results to dictate our actions. And I think people get caught in this a lot where it's if I post and I don't see the ROI, if I send an email and I don't get an answer, if I do a sales call and I don't get the sale, then I'm going to stop doing the thing. And to me, that's the equivalent of waking up every day, looking down at your physical body and going, nothing really looks different today. I'm not going to go to the gym. I'm not going to do my workout. Could you imagine if every day you determined whether or not you're actually going to get movement in based on how your body looked? It's crazy. We have to be really mindful of that. So that's one of the things that I look at, taking messy action, monitoring my expectations. And really, it's so hard to do. It's easy to say, but keeping your blinders on. Because at the end of the day, there is a lot of competition. There is a ton of saturation. And again, that's in any industry. And like you said, when you were becoming a hairdresser, it's like there's already a lot of them. And you said there's a lot of people. And I always use the coffee shop analogy, right? We lived in New York City. We lived in Manhattan for years. There's a coffee shop on literally every street corner. The same block will have four coffee shops. And so you have to recognize why. And it's a good thing, right? If there's saturation in a market, it means that there's market demand. So there's a lot of coffee shops because we're addicted to coffee. And so then you ask yourself the question of why do people go to one over the other? And so I'll ask you, why would you go to a certain coffee shop? Yeah, the vibe. Maybe it's the type of coffee. If I like the way they brew it, definitely you got to go try things on. And I think people like variety as well. What I learned in the hairdressing world is I have clients for years, but they might go try someone else here and there, but they came back. If I was the flavor they liked, they came back. And I agree to your point. That's one of the things about even being in the same industry as somebody else. Your uniqueness and your authenticity is what's going to keep somebody or repel them, which is a good thing. And that's why I love the word authenticity, though it's getting thrown out a lot. It's really about being able to show up as the version of yourself that you want to attract because like does attract. And I found that to be true in the hair salon, the girl with the shaved head and all the tattoos. That's what her clients look like. I think we miss that concept of what Mike was saying to you. Is it fun? Are you able to show up as yourself and bring in people that feel aligned that you want to work with? Because if you just have a book of business and you don't like the clients you're serving, that's definitely not going to be fun because I was in a season of that where I said yes to everything because while I was in my season of throwing spaghetti against the wall and just saying yes to see what I liked. And I think coaches have to go through that season too. Just because someone else is offering a service or a product doesn't mean that maybe is what you should be offering or what you should be coaching or teaching to. So there are a lot of early stage things you can try on to see what fits for you. And like she said earlier about not having these expectations of oh shit, that actually doesn't feel aligned for me. Or maybe if I do a podcast and I feel like I don't really like podcasting anymore, then I failed. Maybe you're just not meant to podcast. There's a lot of things, like you said, learning how to create your own website. Maybe you learned that's not my zone of genius. Maybe that's the thing I hire out. But because you learned how to do it, you now know how to hire. 
So there's so many intricacies, I think, in running your own business. And there's something I've watched you do over the years, which is not just create an amazing business that helps so many other people start theirs and become successful, but it's the freedom that you've also included along with, I think now your ability to be able to scale the business the way you have. What would you say to people in the beginning, though, because this kind of happened for me and I'll share candidly when I was in other coaching programs or masterminds, there was this talk of don't do it unless it's scalable, meaning they wanted you to do all these things. But if it wasn't scalable, don't bother. Almost hire all of these things out. And so there was a time for me where I got it wasn't an ego necessarily, but it was a confusion level of if I do that, it's not scalable. But I really think a lot of the non-scalable things are what have actually moved my business In the beginning, me getting in the DMs, talking to clients, me being the one that shows up on my stories, me being the one who writes the copy for my emails. So can we speak to that? Because I want to prevent anyone from getting in a situation where they think they can't do certain things because it's not quote unquote scalable. I think the most important thing, and this is what we always teach in our company, is build your business around your life, not your life around your business. Mm -hmm. So really simply, even when we're talking about making an aligned decision and is it fun, Years ago, I remember I was doing calls on a Sunday afternoon for clients because they had all voted and that's when they wanted calls. And every single week, I'm like annoyed that I have a call on a Sunday. And Mike was like, what are you doing? It's your business, right? That's what I mean by the decisions that you're making. But at the end of the day, your life should come first. And so it's really important to take a step back and actually ask yourself, do you want those things? Do you want to scale? Do you want to hire out? Do you want to have a team? Or are you cool with being your own boss and maybe you are trading time for money? Maybe it's not something that you are scaling. Maybe it's not something you're trying to sell in the future, but you just don't want to have a J-O-B, right? Like you want to be your own boss and you want to have that creative freedom. And are you good with making six figures a year or are you striving to go seven, multiple seven, eight figures a year? I think we blindly follow other people's goals often. To your point of she has a podcast, I have to have one and he's writing a blog, so I have to have one and they're speaking on stage, so I should speak on stage. And we look at success is the worst teacher. And so we often look and we go, success leaves clues and this person's doing X, Y, Z, so I should do X, Y, Z. And then you get into the trenches and you're like, I don't even X, I hate Y, and I don't even know how to do Z. And you're like, wait a minute, hold on, how did I get here? So really take a step back and first ask yourself, do I want those things? Because so many of my clients have no interest in building the business structure that I have, which is a team. And there's a lot of systems and there's meetings and there's automations. And to be frank, what I do today on the day-to-day is not at all what I used to do seven years ago. And so as you are scaling, if that's something that you want to do, you're likely stepping out of the role in which you started and you're stepping into a new role of maybe more leadership or sort of CEO, which I'm not the CEO. I think people throw that term around a lot and they're not necessarily the CEO. I never want to be a CEO that is not my zone of genius. That's not the stuff I like doing at all. If anything, I'm the visionary, I'm the founder, right? And I still am the creator, I'm still the coach, but more of my day-to-day is management. It's people management, it's process management. And we have a COO and she's actually all of the processes and the automations, but again, there's like managing that has to happen. And so that's something that you really need to look at where I too have been in programs and the first solution is go hire. And I'm like, go hire, I'm not making any money. How am I supposed to outsource this right now? So. That's not always the answer. You have to check in with yourself. Is that something that you want to do? And at the end of the day, there is clarity and contrast. So we don't know that we don't like olives until we taste olives. You might have to actually try that model or try to hire someone or go for the membership or open up the high ticket mastermind or put on your first in-person event. You do need to try it in order to see if you like it. But one thing that I would say is Do it more than once because trying it all of once is not a good dictator of if you like it or not. You may have just brushed your teeth, right? And anything you eat is going to be disgusting. So give yourself a fair shot. Try something a few times, making small tweaks and iterations before you just scrap it because you might just not like it because you're not good at it yet. You might just not like it because you're not confident in it yet. And action breeds confidence. Action also breeds clarity. So there is repetition that we do need to put in before we start to feel quote unquote ready. Ready is an illusion. People are always like, I'm waiting until I'm ready. You can't do that. That's an oxymoron. The only way we feel ready is to do something. So we have to do it, try it, take action on it. And then you'll start to get more clarity, more confidence, more readiness, and more understanding of, is this something that I actually want? Being mindful of just blindly following other people's goals. That is huge. And it's part of what I wrote my book about before I even had the words to put it together. The book is titled The Art of Unbecoming Who They Told You To Be. 
And it was these conditioned beliefs as we grow up around what we should do, what is successful and how we're meant to present ourselves to the world. And I, quote unquote, did all the things my mom expected of me, buy the house, get married, stay in the job for 25, 30 years. She really encouraged me that I was bored. She was like, you're bored. That's why you don't want to do hair anymore. I hit boredom 10 years ago or whatever. You just need to reinvent yourself. And while she may have been correct in that field, I could have probably taken my career to a different place while still doing hair per se. But it actually pissed me off because I was like, I'm not bored. I just know that I meant to do more and to experience more on a personal level, which felt selfish because I owned a salon that supported other people's livelihoods. And so to make the decision to literally disappoint everybody in my life from my one decision felt really selfish. And it's something that like personally I've worked through that I've never really shared, but I make jokes about it. Of I disappointed everybody in order to take action on my goals and dreams. And it's not to say that I haven't questioned it time and time again of just like go back to what you know, go back to where there's quick hits of validation. Validation. Moving into the online space where you don't necessarily have that, it can feel really delusional at times of the expectations that you have. And so I think you do such a brilliant job with how you show up and coach and teach to the realness of what needs to get done day in and day out to have a business that feels aligned for you. You just talked on your stories this morning about the 72 people that just went through your 12 week program. Will you tell us a little bit about that and maybe who that's for? Yeah. I'm a huge advocate for structure and systems and all the logical because I believe structure creates freedom. It truly does. The more structure that you can have in the business, the more freedom you have to do with the creative things. And if you're like me, a creative visionary, the downloads come every day. I'm an idea machine. I could care less if I finish a project. I just want to constantly be birthing new projects. And so as a creative visionary, which are many founders and coaches, it can feel very suffocating and very boxed in when you think of things like systems because they could feel like they're keeping you inside like a container as opposed to having that freedom, but it really is the opposite. So the program that we were talking about this morning on Stories, that is our signature program. It's called Empower. It's a 12-week group coaching program. We've been running it now for six and a half years, which is crazy. And we've had about a thousand students go through. We only run it one time per year live now. So we used to do about four lives a year, and then we pared it down and down. That's really for the person, any industry who has expertise, lived experience, and an idea of something that they want to share to help people through transformation. And they want to package that up and turn it into an online group coaching program or course themselves. So it's the one-to-many model. That's what we're teaching. It's great if you have some one-on-ones. It's fine if you have never had any clients. does not matter. And it's soup to nuts. So everything in there from literally setting up your business bank account, we have an accountant, we have a lawyer, we've got the mindset coach, and then all the way through social media, building out whatever it is that you are building out, your course, launching it, enrolling people into it. So right now our folks are graduating next week, which is really exciting. So they're currently on week one of their programs that they've built with the clients that they've enrolled during the 12 weeks that they've been with us. So in real time action, I love that. And you guys, when I tell you there aren't a lot of people who will take you from point A of I just have an idea to literally in 12 weeks, she's telling you that they are in their first week of launching their product or service. When you talk about fast action, when you talk about throwing spaghetti at the wall and being messy, this is structured messiness because maybe you just have an idea and you're not like 100% sure about it, but at least see it to fruition, test it out, track the data. How do you feel? Is it working? Is it not? Do I like what's happening? If not, you have a blueprint that you already created for one thing that you can rinse and repeat, like she said, for say something else that you want to do, whether it's a product or a service. So I think having these foundational things are so key. And I can't stress enough how much time, energy, and money it will save you if you go through the right programs first. I definitely think things like life coaching and other business courses can be helpful once you have this stuff in order. You can't really skip this hard stuff. And that's why a lot of people do skip it because us visionaries and creatives are like, I just want to do it when it feels good. And I want to show up when I want to. And I'm here to tell you that most days I don't want to. I want to go for a walk on the beach. I want to go play with my kid. I don't want to get ready for the day. I don't want to podcast sometimes. But when you have systems in place, when you have things already set up, you get up, you do the things, and then you see the action and the results that are happening for both your business and the people you're getting to help. So that's my two cents and why I really wanted to have Jess on, because not only is she someone that I've watched for years, literally refine and refine this, and I'm not affiliated. This is not a let me sell you on my friend's program. It's the thing for me that... Sometimes we can look at other people's successes, like she said earlier, and think those are the things we should have. But when you look at it as a whole, 
Maybe it's not what you're willing to show up for. Maybe it's not actually the expertise that you have or the experience you want to like dive into to share because what level of you is going to have to show up in order to do that? Do you have to become a completely different person? Maybe you don't want to do that. So these are things that you can dig into, but realize as you're putting something together from start to finish, am I someone who's willing to show up for this? Or what are my expectations of how well this is going to do based on how I'm willing to show up for it? So there's a lot of levels to it. And when we can take the comparison out, and you can also work in real time with 50, 60, 70 other people, you can start to see you're not alone. It's okay to ask for help. Putting systems and structures in place is going to save you years of should I or shouldn't I? You're like, no, it just is what we should do because it's been tried and tested by a thousand other people. And that's the cool thing of when we can take the guesswork out of entrepreneurship. A lot of times we want to color outside of the lines, but there are people who have left clues of what works as far as email marketing and how you show up. I really always try to not make this such a business podcast, but it's something that I'm going through in real time, setting up a business the right way that feels aligned for me that creates this freedom. But ultimately, I think we all have to figure things out as we go. So I hope you guys get value out of these podcast episodes that you can take just one little nugget like Jess heard on that car ride of something that can resonate for you that you're like, shit, that's what I needed to hear. I need to take action on something. And she is a wealth of resource. If you go over to her page, you can listen to her podcast also. But I want to dive now more into some of the personal stuff that maybe you've gotten to work through, because while I've seen all of your successes and while it looks like it's all worked from the outside, you did mention crying on the couch a couple of times. I was just kidding. It was one time. Let's talk about what you've had to work through in order to hold the capacity to now have a team and step into this role of management even, because from teacher and online coach to now you've grown and scaled this company. What iterations of Jess have had to happen? We got an hour and a bottle of wine. Walk me through that because I could ask you any question when it comes to this. And I'm sure you've got lots of fun answers to share because I think that's the part where I want to always keep it real on the show. And you've literally chosen one of the most unscripted paths. You, you keep choosing all of the unscripted paths and creating lanes for other people to do the same, which I love. So yeah, let's dive into some of the work you maybe had to do and maybe some of the mentors or people you've had a chance to work with that have helped you. I'm so grateful to say the work started over 20 years ago, which is amazing. I had a 10-year battle with an eating disorder, got to a place where I had actually checked myself into an outpatient program when I was in college. And so this was probably now 23 years ago or so. That was the first breadcrumb on the trail that I've been on now for the last two decades, where it was actually the first time I asked for help that I could remember. And that asking for help saved my life. And that was the evidence that I needed that it was like, oh, okay, that was really scary. That was really hard but choose your heart. Being in the eating disorder for 10 years was far harder than asking for help. And when I asked for help, I got this incredible return on that ask. And so it very slowly started to unravel and unfold. And I'm very grateful. I grew up in a household where every year for my birthday and Hanukkah, I would get chicken soup for the teenage soul and the secret. And my mom had subliminal message tapes that she would put on when I would go to bed at night. So very tapped in parents, very tuned in. And so the work for me always was present. So I wasn't scared of it. I wasn't confused by it. I just wasn't doing it, right? And then come my early 20s, I was. And then I probably shut it down for a couple of years. And then in my later 20s, got really heavily back into it. And honestly, it started with what I call a lot of gateway books and gateway podcasts. Nothing wrong with them. The books that are like, you're a badass and you're great and you're worth it, that type of stuff. And so I could not consume that stuff fast enough in my mid and late 20s. This is now at the same time that I'm dabbling in this online industry and I'm doing bodybuilding and I'm seeing all these other people, men and women online, where they're doing these great big things. And I did not come from a family of entrepreneurs. I came from doctors, lawyers, and accountants. And so being an entrepreneur was not an option. I didn't even know what it was until I was 30. Truly did not know what an entrepreneur was, had no intention or desire, and already felt, gosh, what have I had to go through? Do you name it? And I've been through it. One of the biggest moments for me was when we first moved to New York and I was hustling and grinding and I built that million dollar business in 18 months. That came at a cost and I lost a lot of friends and I had a lot of health problems. And there was one specific night where Mike came home from work and I was on my knees in the apartment and I was crying and he came in. Are you okay? What happened? I said, I just got a call back from the doctor. They think I have breast cancer. I have to go in for further testing. And that unfolded into many different appointments, which really just unraveled into I was completely burnt out. I had adrenal fatigue. I had completely depleted myself and worked myself to sick and fortunately did not have cancer. But it was a wake up call where for us, it was like everything needed to change in that moment. That's actually when Empower was born because I went from doing one on ones to switching to one to many. 
and the business exploded and I got my time back and was like, wow, this is amazing. But over the years, my goodness, difficult conversations, hiring, firing, feeling as though I've been backstabbed, having clients take proprietary information or just copy my program and sell it themselves. Specifically in 2021, I went through my own really heavy, big time shamanic death. And through that process, actually shut my entire Instagram account down, which I think you know this. I had about 32,000 followers on my Instagram account. It was the account that I built my entire business on at that point, eight years or something like that. Decided to shut it down, start completely fresh and change my name. So my married name is DeRose, but I'm actually not legally DeRose. I've never actually changed my name. I'm still Glazer. And when I started the new account, which is now just about two years ago, there were a lot of questions as to what are you doing? You're nuts. Why are you doing that? And for me, it was part of that process of what I was going through. The coaching industry had a big pendulum swing going on at the moment. There was a lot of things going on in the industry that I really didn't agree with, that I didn't like, that I felt were out of integrity in some of the marketing. There were people that I wanted to disassociate with. There were friendships that I chose to walk away from. And I just wanted a clean slate. I truly just wanted to start fresh. And people thought I was nuts. I've had so many articles and I used to do a lot of TV appearances when I was a trainer and people were like, no one's going to be able to find any of that stuff anymore. And I'm like, that's okay. That's part of this journey for me. I don't need the awards and the accolades to feel validated. And in my late thirties at the time, that really was the work for me of I'm okay regardless. I'm inherently worthy and not watch me build it. It wasn't like watch me build another page so I could prove it. It was, I'm actually okay if it never builds. And at the same time, there was also a lot of clients like, you don't get it, you don't get it, you don't get it. And I'm like, you know what? Let me get back in the trenches with you because I teach organic marketing, so no ads. I'm like, all right, let me get back in the trenches with you. I'll go to zero followers with you with a completely different name where people probably won't find me and let's do it together. And I won't lie, the very first launch that we did on that new Instagram account page, I was scared shitless because my whole business is running off of organic social media and my email list. And it was the biggest launch we had ever had. And it has continued every single time to be the biggest launch we've ever had continuously. So it was just proof in the pudding. Watch me do it again. Okay, cool. Multiple six-figure launches, under a thousand followers, doesn't matter. This is why we want to build email lists and stuff like that. So I've been through it all. Name a challenge and I've been through it. And I've also shared on my podcast, personal life stuff too. When life is lifing, how do you show up for business? And I apologize if this is a trigger to anybody, but in September of 2022, during our launch, we do a two week in a studio. It's a whole thing, like a big live studio production. And day three, got rushed into the hospital, had an ectopic pregnancy that I did not know about, lost my right fallopian tube. Just about a year later, 10 weeks pregnant, ended up having a miscarriage. Again, during a massive launch, what you do, it's no different than a death in the family or a parent who's sick or a divorce that's happening. We have had shit go down. And that's where I'm so grateful for the systems because that launch during the ectopic pregnancy still happened. The team did the entire thing and I was not there and they ran the whole thing and it was wildly successful and our clients were very happy. No one knew until I think I shared about 12 weeks after publicly what had happened and people were like, what? And we have all these behind the scenes images of me literally in a diaper bent over doing a presentation where I'm just chest up in the camera which was a choice. I wanted to show up that day for a camera. I've had all sorts of crap go down. <laughs> and still, I think that's the beautiful thing about when we unintentionally put people on pedestals that seem successful and have thriving accounts and seem like they're just on the top of the world. They're still human. And I always want to humanize people to the level where we feel like we see ourselves in their story or there's some empathy around. They didn't just wake up here. There's a lot of hard work and your life still lifes at everybody. And, and I think we all have our down days where we feel like I'm taking three steps forward and then the next day it's 10 steps back. And even in those examples that you shared, that's got to be what some of that feels like sometimes. We're like having so much success in one area of our life, but in other areas we're struggling. And I think that's the beautiful journey that we're all here to experience. And at times, as much as I talk about it and try to stay positive, there are certain things where that's why it's great to have a community of people who understand the different seasons that we're in. And when you think about creating support in your life, I know you have your husband. Oh, he sounds like he's coming with some clutch one-liners to be like, yo. <laughs> Yeah, Mike's a legend. But just building friendships and building community and finding that support as you grow a business that can sometimes feel lonely. And the only reason I say that, and I used to combat that, of if you feel lonely, it's your fault. But I came from an industry where I never felt alone. I was always surrounded by people. I was working on people, literally, physically. And I didn't even know what that really meant. 
comments like it feels lonely at the top or this, that, whatever. I was like, I'm literally never alone. And then when you have children, you're really never alone. To experience that now in my 40s, working alone, working from home, building something alone before you have a team. Where can people turn to? Did you lean on podcasts or how do you create friends in the online space of people that feel like they're your spiritual running buddies? I think there's different levels. You said it even before about a mentor. I've had so many mentors that don't even know that I exist. There are people on the internet that I follow, I consume, I look up to, and I consider them mentors. And then there's mentors that I actually pay or coaches that I pay or consultants that I pay. So I think that there's a variety, especially for the person who's scared to invest or I'm not ready or my spouse doesn't support me or whatever that might be. I'm a huge reader. I'm a huge advocate for reading, even if it's an audiobook. If that's not your jam, if you don't like reading, I do believe readers are leaders. I think it's our birthright to read, honestly, because what we get to do is we get to collapse time. So we get to learn what it took somebody 30, 40, 50 years to learn, and we can learn it in 200 pages. And so I think we'd be foolish not to take advantage of that. And I didn't always feel that way. I'm pretty certain I never read a book in high school. Thank you, Cliff Notes and Spark Notes for getting me through high school. But as an adult in my mid 20s, really started just consuming books like crazy. I started listening to podcasts a very long time ago. It was like 2013 when I started listening to them. And at the time, Lewis Howes, I don't think I missed one of his episodes back in like 2014, 2015. But yeah, I've had a lot of different mentors. I've been with my current mentor for four years, James Wedmore. He's amazing at what he does. And really for the four years we've been working with him, our focus has really been like scaling the team. So we have five on our executive leadership team and then we have 14 coaches as well. And that's not for everybody. The process and like the formulation that we're creating is very much mirrored off of how he has built his team. So I think when you are looking for a mentor, it's really important to learn from people who do different things than you. But then also, can you learn from people who have something similar that you want to emulate? And I've had everything from spiritual mentors to mindset mentors to money mentors to business mentors and everything else in between. Do you remember the episode? I didn't actually watch it, but I love Lucy where she's doing like all the chocolates going on the conveyor belt. That's what I picture. It's there's this conveyor belt and passing you on the conveyor belt are all these different items. And these items can fall into buckets or they can fall into departments. Most of us that get into coaching and entrepreneurship in this capacity get into it because we have a particular skill. And so there's something that you're really good at. You're a personal trainer, you're a nutritionist, you're a hairstylist, you're an accountant. There's something that you have worked on, you've fostered, you've learned, you've mastered, maybe you've gone to schooling for, got certifications on, so on and so forth. And then so you want to teach it to other people, right? Or you've been through like a massive transformation in your life and you want to share it with other people. And when you step into the ring, what you don't realize is that is not equal to starting an Instagram page, putting up a post, and now you have a business. And I don't say that to stress anybody out or make you feel like you can't do it. But when you step into building a business, no matter how big or small it is, you now also have to learn the skills of marketing, copy, messaging, sales, organization, planning, project management. There's so many skills that you need to learn, all these little pieces of chocolate that are going by. And so when you're in business, the way that I see it is you spend a little time in one area. You're not going to master that skill, but you read the books, you listen to the podcast, you go to the events, you get the mentor, and you start to learn about copy. And when you get to a place where you're like, okay, it's good enough for right now, then you move to the next thing. And from copy, maybe you then move into sales and you learn enough about that. And then you move into the next thing and that's technology. And then you move into the next thing and you go through all these different departments. And when you get to the last one, let's say there's five of them. After you get to the fifth one, guess where you go? Back to number one. And you just repeat this process time and time again, year over year, where you just keep getting better and you keep refining these different departments and different skills and processes. But as we talked about before, expectations, if you just expect yourself to be good at all the things that you've literally never learned, you did not go to college for marketing. You did not take a class on copywriting. Why do you think you'd automatically be good at those things? And then to be frustrated when you're not good at them and not give yourself the tools and the resources to get better at them, it's honestly, I think, a self-sabotaging thing a lot of the times, but it's also a rude awakening where you're like, oh, I didn't realize how much work this was gonna take because when you work for a company, big, small, corporate, doesn't matter, you're generally going in to do your skill. Even when I was a teacher, I was the phys ed teacher. I wasn't the math teacher. I was the elementary school phys ed and health teacher. I went in to do phys ed and health. Could I teach elementary school math? Possibly, but I will tell you, Singapore math, very confusing if you didn't learn it. So that wasn't my unique skill. I also wasn't the principal. 
I wasn't talking to the parents. I wasn't writing the emails to the Board of Ed. I wasn't making decisions on these things. So you come in to do your thing and other people are supporting around you to do their thing. And that's what makes a company. But when we step into coaching, we think, okay, I'm going to share my stuff on social media and it's going to work. And it's not necessarily. It does take a little bit of time and it's exciting. You did ask about resources though. So yes, podcasts, I feel like I went through gateways. Like 10 years ago, it was like very fluffy and now it's like much deeper. So even with books, I've been studying Dr. Joe Dispenza and quantum physics and stuff for about five years now. I went to his advanced retreat a year and a half ago. It was incredible. So I've moved further away from the, you're great and more into the, oh, how do we actually create a life with our mind? Every book behind me on my shelf, I've read every marketing and sales and copy book and all the podcasts. And I stay plugged in. Even today, I'm a member of a couple different memberships that are just really feel good memberships that just remind you in the morning that you are a badass and you can do cool shit because it's tough the every day and you forget sometimes what you're able to do. And I'm plugged into a lot of different things. And some of them aren't even mentorship. We have a huge philanthropy arm of our business. My husband and I are philanthropists and we built a school in Ghana, Africa, and we continue to fund that school year over year and the students there and the community there. And one of the things that we do is we stay really plugged into the organization in which we did that with, which is Pencils of Promise. Love them. Shout out to Pencils of Promise. But we even just had a call last week with the CEO of Pencils of Promise. And it's like, how can we stay plugged into the things that really light us up and remind us who we are and what we're capable of doing. And it's not always like tactical business stuff, right? Sometimes it's just who's an expander for me? Who's showing me what's possible? Who's reminding me of what I'm capable of? I've been in masterminds and coaching programs for nine years. So I've good. never not had a coach. I always remember that about you, always sharing that. And I think multiple at different times. Oh my God, this was so juicy. So good. Thanks for getting us all inside of the everything because Often podcasts can be really granular on a couple of things. And I just wanted to introduce you to my community because you are so amazing. You've done so much and you live life and you and your husband participate in helping serve so many other people. And you also have something that I can't wait to jump into. I was just talking to my girlfriend Haley yesterday about, which are some of your lower ticket, easier, accessible. If you're just getting started, want to see what this world is all about that just runs. Tell us about some of these new things that you've just launched. They're really freaking cool. Yeah, thanks. I'm so excited. We love Haley. Shout out to Haley. We have a monthly membership. It's called The Club. And so our monthly membership, you can cancel anytime, come in, dip your toe, or you can stay. And if you commit to a year, you get two months free. It's really for anyone. And it's so crazy. We have people in there who are just in the ideation phase. And then we have people that are doing seven figures a year who just want to be plugged into a community. So with The Club membership, you get monthly trainings. So every month I'm doing a different training, a masterclass, a challenge, a workshop, and it's soup to nuts, anything in business. The goal in The Club is really to reignite the spark for you. When you come over to my page, you'll quickly learn. I'm like a New York City club girl. I started going when I was 14. Clubs, raves, outdoor parties, festivals, like that is where I feel most at home, just being able to dance and move. So that's where the idea came from, because honestly, in business, it can feel really stagnant sometimes. And none of us got into this to sit behind our laptops for 12 hours a day and do 100 Zoom calls. We did not. So the idea of the club is to really reignite that spark. And our goal is that in the club, whatever we're working on, whatever we're learning, the end of the day is how do we make more sales? How do we make more money in our business? How do we make more impact? So whether we're doing social media trainings or we're doing messaging trainings or we're talking about funnels, it's everything and anything in between. That would be our lowest ticket offer. And it's brand new because we've actually never had a super low ticket offer like that before. So it's the most affordable way to come into our world for sure, other than all of our free stuff. And it's a blast. It's really fun. I'm not sure when this episode is dropping, but our July masterclass is so freaking fun. I cannot wait for it. Let's see if we can squeeze it out soon. But either way, that's the thing with getting into cool memberships. There's always something exciting. And being a part of a community, that can be the thing that if you are feeling lonely in business, just connecting with other people who are in real time, actively wanting to learn and grow and share and hold support for one another. That's key for me, I think, for people staying in the game long term and realizing yeah. like, hey, oh, you struggle with that too. Great. Let's be support accountability buddies. I've met so many cool people in groups like that and in courses and programs when working for Chris over the years, the mastermind communities, like the people that have come into the groups together, like they stay friends for years. I have friends still from the very first one I joined back in 2019. So whether it's a low ticket offer or something more high price, you can figure out where you fit in, what you need for your business. And in real time, being able to ask questions, I don't know how long they'll have access to you through that, but you always over deliver, over serve, and you're just such an amazing human. I'm so grateful to have you in my world and get to share you with the audience here. You guys, all of this stuff will be down in the show notes. 
if you want to join me in the club, let's go. Let's go learn from Jess because she's done a thing or do. And I'm ready to take things up a notch in my business. And so I know anybody who listens to the show probably is too. And congrats on the pregnancy. I can't wait for the little mini baby in the club. We got to get her with the disco ball. <laughs> we don't know if it's a boy or a girl, but this baby's coming in September and we are going straight to the club. That is hilarious. I just saw a mini you. I was a mini you with a little disco ball in the cute little disco outfit. So we'll see. Let's do a poll. That's the board where you get to pick. I always like a good bet on people if they're having 50-50, you're getting one or the other. Oh my God. I love you. Thank you so much. You guys, you know what to do if you love the show. Send us a shout out. Give us a little hit of validation if you had any ahas or takeaways. Just tag us on social media. But again, all of this good stuff will be in the show notes. And we'll see you guys in the next episode of Unscripted. Bye.